Hello friends, good morning. This is Danun Jai uh, with today's current affairs known as Astra. So what is this series all about? This series is all about making your preparation for UPSC particularly from current affairs perspective very easy. This is also an initiative how to cover the so called the Hindu in the everyday current affairs. So I am taking the Hindu as it is. I am going to tell you what are the important components particularly from prelims component. If there are something which is important for mains also, I just give you a brief idea about it so that you can cover in your regular classes wherever you are going on. So this is about Astra. So let's go to today's Astra. So this is the thing guys. Today I am going to discuss about 29th edition of the Hindu and I am going to cover what are the important things for prelims as well as mains from this Hindu component. So this is Astra. So this is Danus Academy. So today you have major things like what are the FTAs that India has. So Nepal is in news because there was some political change that has happened in Nepal. So that question might be asked regarding the so-called borders which are sharing with Nepal. We'll just see that also. And most important one thing that is coming from the historical perspective that is Ramapa temple because uh, our president has made a uh, made in visit to this temple so just look at that temple and then continuing with G20 resolutions that was in news obviously for this entire year G20 will be in news and definitely there will be a question in prelims as well as in mains about this G20 so this is Anujay with all these news so for contact you can make this as a contact point for us so let's start with what else there for us in today's newspaper so the front page of the Hindu carries about something called uh, some regional news about a campaign which has happened in a regional party meeting. Uh, so some bad news that is coming from Andhra Pradesh and then you have COVID spike likely but no wave. So this is something that we have to be very not only as an aspirant but as a common human being as a citizen it is our civic responsibility to ensure that we don't contribute for a spike in COVID-19. As for the official records, January is going to record highest number of COVID cases in India also. Hence, we have to be alert. One positive aspect that India has is as for the official statements, there might be a spike, but there might not be a wave that we have seen in our first and most devastating second wave of COVID. So having said this, so let's be alert in the coming months, at least for one month or two months, let's maintain that social distance norms as a responsible citizen that is our civic duty. Right, this is what we have in the front page. Going on to this page, as I said, President has visited 13th century Ramappa temple and she has made a, a visit to this now. So what are the things that she has covered? So what she said, Telangana was endowed with several places of historical and spiritual significance like, such as Samakka Saraka Jatra, the biggest tribal festival. This is important guys. So which is the biggest tribal festival in the world, Samakka Saraka Jatra celebrated in Telangana district, Telangana state. So that is the thing. So about this Jatara, this is particularly celebrated by Koya tribes. So there is one tribe known as Koya tribes. So this might be a question and it is celebrated once in two years, once in two years event. So this is a biannual event that is another thing that we have to remember so this is about Samakka Saraka Jatra for prelims and then she moved on to the so-called Badrachalam as a part of her maiden visit Badrachalam is the famous temple that is located in way uh, it is located on the banks of river Krishna and that is present in Telangana region so that is the thing that we have to know and then she made a visit to the so-called 13th century Ramappa temple. So 13th century Ramappa temple is in use. I'll give you more details which are important for prelims from this perspective also. Now, Government of India has started one great program to ensure that uh, the tribal students in the country are getting educated. That is called Ekalavya Model Residential Schools. President also inaugurated two schools in these tribal districts. It has to be noted that particular one of good tribal groups in India, there are 75 among them. Telangana has highest number of tribal groups in the country. So with that perspective, this Ekalavya model schools were introduced. So what are the things? So Telangana has Samakka Saraka Jatra or the Medaram Jatra. It is celebrated once in two years. 
Goya tribe celebrated. This is first thing. Ramappa temple, second thing. Third one is Bhadrachalam. Fourth one is Ekalavya model school. So let's see about this temple called the famous Ramappa temple. So we have seen about Sri Shrailam temple which is dedicated to Lord Shiva. Now this is Lord Vishnu temple that is Lord Rama temple. Ramappa temple is Lord Rama temple. So as for this biggest star in the network of medieval Indian temples in the deep Del Deccan region is Ramappa temple. So what are the key features about this Ramappa temple? It was constructed in the year 1213 by Kakatiya Empire, person known as Recharla Rudra. So during Kakatiya rule, Recharla Rudra has built it. Who is Recharla Rudra? He is the general, he is military general of Kakatiya king that is Ganapati Deva. So Ganapati Deva is the king. Recharla Rudra is the general who has constructed this in the 13th century AD, that is in the beginning of 13th century AD. Who is deity here? Rama Lingeshwara Swami. Sorry, this is Rama Lingeshwara Swami. Again, this is a Shiva temple, not Vaishnava temple. This is Shiva temple, guys. So Rama Lingeshwara Swami temple. It is known as Ramappa because this was sculpted by a person known as Ramappa. So Ramappa is the name of the sculptor who carved this temple and this is the only temple perhaps this is the only temple in India and the world where a temple was named after the sculptor that is one important thing. So he worked on this for 40 years that is the reason why uh, Dharapati Deva has given this name as Ramappa temple. No. So it has a unique sandbox technique. Not, not only Ramappa temple, many of the uh, Dravidian temples in India, if you look at the so-called Puri Jagannatha temple, Konak San temple, Ramappa temple, all these have sandbox techniques. What is that sandbox technique? Give me a type, I'll tell you. The lower part of the temple is red sandstone, important guys, while white goprams is built with white. So goprams are with white sandstones. So the gopram here is made up of white sandstones, whereas the red is red sandstone. The base is red top is white so this is some other feature that might be asked in after and architecture next it is known as the brightest star in the galaxy of medieval indian temples right so this was the comment that was made by european travelers now what is the sandbox technique in order to give a very fine balance to the temples in the medieval indian times what they used to do is they used to first dig, dig the land clear the land to some depth and then they used to fill it with sand. Sand acts as a perfect cushion during the times of some turmoil like if there is sudden earth shake movements then obviously sand is going to fill it and that is going to stabilize your architecture and that is the famous architecture that Indians have found something which we have to appreciate. <coughs> so it is a so before construction of temple they dig up the foundation they fill with sand, jagri and karakaya, black fruit before building the temples and sandboxes. After this they build a temple on this. So this act as a cushion in case of earthquakes or some earth slides that is going to happen. So this is about Ramappa temple guys. So the temple is, the deity is Ramalingeshwara Swami which means Shiva temple constructed in 1213, Recharla Rudra. Then you have Ganapati Deva is the king at that point of time of Kakatiyas. Now this is the only temple which was named after the sculptor known as Ramappa. Now one famous thing about this Ramappa temple is it is <coughs> added in UNESCO's World Heritage Site. So UNESCO gives heritage sites of cultural and uh, environmental sites. So India has total 40 sites in that 38th site was Ramappa temple. <coughs> After Ramappa temple, two more things were added for this. So you have to know what are all the 40 world cultural heritage sites, world heritage sites of India. It includes your 39 cultural heritage sites and one mixed heritage sites also. So in this, what are these? You just have a look at it. Particularly in Telangana, you have Kakatiya Rudreshwara Ramappa temple. Right in Mahabalipuram or in Tamil Nadu, you have group of monuments at Mahabalipuram, Chola temples. These are the two things. And in Kerala, you have 
mountain ranges of Darjeeling in West Bengal, Nilgiri Hills, Tamil Nadu. Next, at Hampi, Karnataka, Pattadakal, Karnataka, in Goa you have churches of Goa. So like this, you have to go through this. Thanks to this, uh, uh, I have taken this from upscfullnotes.com. A very good uh, map pointing exercise is done by these guys. So I have taken for this. Just download it and have a look at what are the temples, what are the cult UNESCO World Heritage Sites that you have. You have to remember all the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. That is very, very important. So Rudreshwara Temple is one among them. That is what I wanted to add and show you. So this is about news coming from the so-called President's visit to South India, particularly in the state of Telangana. Moving on to the editorial page, turning a type. Now, this is speaking about India's global exports and imports and how is our global exports are being hit at a time of global turmoil. So, one positive news is from the last two months, exports are showing some drastic, some uh, inclination in the exports. So, this is acting in favor of India. That is one uh, point but this might not sustain over a period of time given the global inequalities or global uncertainties particularly like war that is going on with Russia, Russia and Ukraine, uh, global war and then, then there are some crises about inflation and COVID-19 surge. Right, these are the things that is making the country quite to be worried. So this is about exports, not much news in that. Labored wages, yes, this is about the same article that we were discussing, discussing yesterday. Government of India has, central government has huge pendings in payment of this Manariga works. As a result, now Manariga is our people who are dependent on this works, they are not getting interest to go on work. This is going to hit because it is demand driven work as we have seen yesterday. Right? So this is the thing. And recently, what are the changes in Manariga? Government of India from January 1, 2023, Government of India is going to include digital capture of Manariga attendance. This is what Government of India is doing. Digital capture of Manariga attendance is being done. So this is something which government, as government is upgrading, they should not delay in payment of the wages. That is what it is being said in this. Again, not much news about this. The next one is Nepal politics, past, present and future. Just two or three points about this, how it will have impact on India for your main questions. So Nepal has trans transformed from monarchy to republic in the year 2008. And then there was some constitutional amendments done in 2015. The most important is how it is going to have impact on India. This is for your GS paper too. So if you look at India, so whenever there is some political in turmoil in the Nepal politics, India tries to intervene and get some advantageous position. Even this time, government of India didn't do that. Rather, it has waited for the outcomes of the elections. And Narendra Modi is the first person to go and congratulate Mr. Prachanda after he has won the elections. Now, this has to be, there was some political turmoil or there were some clashes between India and Nepal in the recent times because of the border issues. But some projects which has been taking up or revived in this particular year is we started a railway project, we started an oil pipeline and then the electricity authority, there is huge transfer of exports and imports of electricity between Nepal and India, that is something which is happening. So these are the three positives or three positive developments between India and Nepal in the year 2022. What are the challenges that is still pertaining as Nepal is having Indian currency as Indian rupee, right? The demonetization of Indian rupee is something which Nepalis are unable to digest it. That has to be uh, tackled very uh, easily. And then recruitment of the Gurkha regiments into the Agnipat scheme. These two are what Nepalis are demanding. So if you are going to have an answer for this, if the central government is going to have an answer for this, then our relationships are going to be formidable, which will be based on equality, mutual trust, respect and benefit for all. So it is going to create equality, mutual trust, benefit for all. So this is something. So what is important here? Nepal, India relations. So good relations in the year 2002 to 2022. What are the things that are still hogging our relationships? These are the things. Just last pair of this article is important. Now for prelims, you have to know what are the borders of border states of Nepal in India. So Nepal states borders with Indian states starting from Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, West Bengal, Sikkim. 
So one, two, three, four, five. So there are five Indian states which are sharing borders with Nepal. So this is the thing that you have to understand or you have to remember guys. So how many states are sharing borders with Nepal? Five states. Next there is some uh, articles on Indian population control measures. Again this is not important for prelims. This is, can be used in mains because in mains you have one topic known as population and associated issues. Right. So what is this article all about? Recently in the last parliamentary session some ruling party MPs have said that India has to implement population control measures, right? So this is article about that. So what the author says is, yes, India needs population control measures because it is very evident that over a period of time, it is huge or rising population is one of the significant regions which has made India's growth rate to go at a very slower pace. However, in the recent times, if you look at the population trends in India, it is slowly stabilizing. And it is very evident from the fact that during the times of independence, that is between 1950, around 1950, the total fertility rate in India was 5.9%. So what is this term called total fertility rate? It is the rate at which uh, a woman who is in that childbearing age can give birth to, to how many babies she can give birth. That is known as fertility rate of any country. So, a woman in her childbearing age, childbearing age, how much, how many babies she can reproduce? This is the reproduction rate of a woman during her childbearing age. In the initial years, it was around six percent in India, but today it has come to two percent. Now, two percent is the total fertility total fertility rate in India, right? Now, as per national, you in India you have one policy known as national population policy of 2011. Now, this policy says that India has to reach a total fertility rate of 2.1 percent by 2020. Now, why 2.5 percent? This is considered as replacement rate. What is replacement? Every family has father and mother. Now, they have to get replaced by two children. We are two, we have two. So that is the concept. That is, this ensures that population is stabilized and we don't suffer from population problems like aging population or dependency population. Over a period of time, our transition will be very fine into the next generation. This is what our national population policy says. Our total fertility rate has to be 2.1% so that it will be near the replacement rate. So we have come below this. So now going ahead with this population census in a very rigid format is not going to help India. That is what this author is saying. So just remember what is total fertility rate. Now what about the population issues? Population uh, related issues in India are mostly politicized speaking about some religion lines. But if you are speaking population only in the context of religion then that is not going to help the country. It has to be uh, viewed from the perspective of the so called developmental issues. That is what the context is. Now, the total fertility rate in India is 2% which is significantly lower than the replacement level of 2.1%. So this is something which is going to have. Even our Foreign Affairs Minister as Jay Shankar has said, forced population control can have a very dangerous consequences. It can create gender imbalances also. That is what he has said. So you can use this statements in the answer writing. So what is the way to go ahead? Yes, India needs to adapt population control measures, but what should be the priority? First thing is you strengthen public health care system so that people will create, so that people will be interested to go and have this family planning, rise awareness about the people, about the family planning in the people, and don't go for forced control measures as was done in the case of 1970s population control measures. So these are the three things that India has to focus. At the same time, you should not forget that Many developing nations, many developing nations and rich countries like Japan is facing a problem like they are declining in young population. We should not land into this type of trouble, declining in young population. We should not, we should maintain our demography in such a way that we will be having strength in our younger generations. For that replacement rate is very, very necessary. So what is the entire article is speaking about? Only two things. One is population uh, control measures necessary. Yes, because 
if you are having poor population uh, growth rate can be slowed down as was visible in india between 1950s to 1990s that is first thing second thing how to plan for these population control measures the last pair of speaks about it right create good public health infrastructure create awareness in the people don't go for forced conversions and then you can use uh, jay shankar's statement in this right now what is total fertility rate what is the replacement rate that we have seen what is india's position now at the same time it has to be taken care that we don't come below the total fertility rate and face the same problem that the rich countries like japan are facing today this is the article which it has been spoken about right so the next one is the legal evidence of freeing hindu temples not that important for you upsc domestic investors help indian markets bug the trend in 2022 this is something which is related to the markets one thing that we have to remember for prelims as far as this is considered is as domestic investors help as domestic investors save their money it is going to add to the so-called economic strength of the country nothing more than that next there is one thing called g20 campaigns for online safety digital innovation is unveiled so india is now taking this road and there is one news here so in, india is making the world to use india stack what is this india stack this might be a prelims question india set india set of open apis and digital public goods and announcing that india would soon also similarly open its telecom stack now what is this india stack india set of open apis so whatever the apis that india had so that is what this will be having india stacks india set of open apis and digital public goods right and we are going to have the similar thing in the so called telecommunication sector also right now india is having this and it is asking that we will have safety online campaign also this is what it is being said just have a look at this term and this term that is more than enough now already we have discussed about what are the one 20 countries in G20, you have to go through it guys. So again, I have given today. So Canada, USA, Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, Argentina. You go to France, UK, Germany, Italy, France, UK, Germany, Italy, European Union, Russia, Japan, China, South Korea, India, J China, India, Indonesia, Indonesia, Australia, South Africa, Saudi Arabia and Turkey. Right. These are the things that you have in G20. Please have a look at it. So this is very important this year. Next. So there is no much news here. So some news for your ethics paper eye for an eye sharia system returns to courts in afghanistan only one thing what is sharia system or islamic law no sharia law or islamic law is a code of living for muslims worldwide so some religious countries like uh, muslim uh, dominated countries what they do is they follow this sharia law what do you mean by sharia law just know that it is a living code for muslims across the world wherever the muslims are there they have to follow this code as per their religious tradition and it offers guidance on issues such as modesty finance and crime so it is speaking about the personal relations that india uh, that people have to maintain when they are in their religion so this is about sharia law now as this law is varied from place to place means as this interpretation of the law is varied from place to place so the local customs cultures and religious texts will determine these things which means it is not uniform across all the regions in a particular locality it varies from local traditions to local traditions as traditions vary from place to place the sharia law interpretation also changes and that is what is causing disturbance in afghanistan that is the thing but we don't need to enter into that aspects just know what is sharia law and then what is the problem associated with the interpretation of this Next one is FDA is chasing service sector push despite manufacturing push. Now, what is this news? So, India has good FDAs coming into the country, but these FDAs are focused on good services sector rather than industrial sector or manufacturing sector. So, India thought that 
though there is Make in India program, but much of FDA sectors are not coming into Make in India manufacturing sector. It is going into service sector. That is what it is. Now, what is important for your UPSC is what is an FDA, right? These things that you should do. What is foreign direct investment? It is an investment made by a firm or an individual in one country into business interest located in another country. So this is an investment made by a firm or individual in one country into other country, right? So a foreigner coming and investing into Indian company and his shares in that company will be more than 10%. If it is less than 10%, it is called foreign portfolio investments, right? So it is always good to have FDI because FDI is for long term investments. It brings capital along with it. It brings technology with it. It enhances the operational measures in a country. So FDI is always good. Whereas FPI is another investment where the investors will invest less than 10% in a particular economy. And then their main aim is to have profits. If they get profits, they immediately withdraw from the country and they go and invest in some other country where they gain more profits. So what is the difference between FDI and FPI? That is the only thing that they might ask. Coming from this, top FDI sourcing countries for India is Singapore, USA, Mauritius, Netherlands, Switzerland. If you are writing some local exams, they might ask this question. So Singapore tops our FDI, followed by USA, followed by Mauritius. Singapore, USA, Mauritius are the top three countries which are sending FDIs into our country. Now, in which sectors it is? located our FDI is going. As I said, it is going into service sectors more than the manufacturing sectors, particularly in the service sector also, computer software and hardware business, followed by service sectors such as banking, insurance facilities, these things. So computer software is the top one where it is going. Next, to which states FDI is going to maximum? So top is Karnataka, Bengaluru, Mumbai, Maharashtra and Delhi. Karnataka, Maharashtra and Delhi, remember these three, these are the things where FDI is going. So this might be some static questions for your prelims. So what is the difference between FDI and FPI? What are the top destinations for our FDI? And what are the major sectors where FDI is involved? And what are the states, Karnataka, Maharashtra, and Delhi are the top three states where FDI is going? So this is about FDI news, guys. They might ask one question here. Next one is trade packs with Australia and the UAE is going to help boost exports. Obviously, trade packs will have some good impacts. Now, what are these trade packs? Trade packs are preferential trade agreements that a country will have with other country. That can be your partial scope agreement, that can be your free trade agreement, that will be your common market, common customs union, as well as markets union. Right? These are different trade packs that you have. You might be seeing that in your basic economics. Now, the thing is, recently India has signed free trade agreements with which countries? UAE and Australia, very, very important for your prelims. Not only this, India has free trade agreement with 13 countries. So you have to remember those 13 countries and I have provided it right here. What are the 13 free trade agreements that India has? India has with SAP countries and ASEAN. These are the two groups with which India has free trade agreement. Along with this, it has with Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka. Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka. And then you have with Mauritius, Mauritius. So these are the borders that which India has free trade agreement. Then Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, South Korea, and Japan. Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, South Korea, Japan, and recently UAE and Australia. So you have to remember these guys. What are the states with which India has this free trade agreements? Remember that free trade agreement. Now what about various types of free trade agreement that I will take some other class and I will discuss what exactly is this free trade agreements and how can we how can we differentiate various types of free trade agreements. But for prelims, whatever is on the board that is more than enough. Next. So a failed attempt at decriminalization. Now recently uh, the government of India has passed a bill known as Jen Vishwas Bill. Now what is this Jen Vishwas Bill? There were so many outdated criminal laws in India. The government of India wants to denotify them so that for petty issues it won't become a criminal offence. So that is a major thing. So decriminalizing 183 offences across 42 leg legislations and enhancing the ease of living and ease of doing business in India. So many countries or many investors are shying away from investing in India because there are many laws which are outdated and which criminalize for silly issues in India. 
almost 183 offenses are like that. The government of India thought that we have to eliminate them so that people will get more interest in doing business in the country. So with that thing, India has introduced Jen Vishwas Bill in 2021. Now what is this article all about? This article speaks about though it is a good thing, though it is a good thing to decriminalize, but what government of India did is rather than criminalization, it has made these offenses from civil criminal to civil. What do you mean by civil offenses? You have to pay some penalties for doing certain uh, wrongs in the country. So this article is speaking about this. So though it has decriminalized 183 offenses across 42 legislations, but replacing it with fines in legislations might be replacement of imprisonments with fines. This can be hardly can be called as decriminalization by because anyways you are going to punish the offender through this act. So this is what it is saying that is completely fine. Just know what is Jen Vishwas Bill. Jen Vishwas Bill is to increase the Vishwas of the people to invest in India. You are decriminalizing it. You are decriminalizing some outdated laws which do not have that vigorous uh, nature of the crime. Right? That is okay. So why there is a proposal to ban on single sale of single cigarettes? Nothing. Sale of single cigarettes, it is known that cigarettes are going to harm the health of the individuals. So if you are selling single cigarettes it is very economical for the people to buy so don't sell single cigarettes sell it in a packet the moment you are selling it in a packet it will become more burden on the person to buy as a result so it is an expectation that people will not be in a position to buy that packet and then uh, do this so this is something that it is speaking about so the data is lancet is saying that 7 million or 70 lakh deaths in the middle income countries are going to come out of smoking. By 2030, 70 lakh people are going to die in all these developed countries as per Lancet. Hence, single sticks being more economical can appeal investors to go and uh, uh, buy this because they have limited amount of money. So now if you are allowing not to sell this, then this investors might not go and buy this. So it would compel a potential customer to buy the entire pack which may not be particularly economical so they might tend to leave it. That is what the news says. One good article today is putting off tax census will only benefit the privileged groups. For whom it is important PSIR students, sociologists, optional students, you have to read this because this is speaking about whether India should have tax basis census in the country. If you have cash basis census, what are the advantages of having it and what are the disadvantages of postponing cash basis census in India? It should be noted that in the year 2011, uh, there were some professional professors and scholars of sociological departments who have said that India should have cash basis census because unless and until you have cash basis census, you cannot know who exactly are getting the benefits in this cash based reservations. Hence, Apart from SCST reservations that government of India collects in ST uh, in regular census, they thought that government might also collect or they wanted government to collect caste and sub caste groups in the country as per census according to the census. But government of India, the top bureaucrats said that this is not uh, a good exercise. This is going to add some trouble to the administrative machinery in getting this data. So that was postponed in that place of census 2011. They have released a separate caste census that is called socio-economic caste census of 2011, SCCC 2011. However, this SCCC was not kept into the public domain. The government thought that this can be misused as a result they were not kept in public domain. But again, this was in news because recently Allahabad High Court said that the local elections, panchayats and municipal elections, which is going in Uttar Pradesh, uh, the government wanted to give special reservations for other backward classes. They wanted to give beyond 27%. Then the High Court of uh, Uttar Pradesh, that is Alhabad High Court, has said you cannot go and do it. So rather than doing it, you have to pass the triple test formula. This triple test formula was given in M. Nagaraju case, saying that if you want to give reservations beyond a particular limit of 27%, you have to look at the population data. You should have population data. That is first thing population data about how many people are located in which census that is the first thing and you have to look at whether giving more reservations would compromise the so-called efficiency in the administrative structure so it would would it kill the so-called merit and would it compromise the efficiency of administration 
that is the second thing that he has said uh, in M Nagarajan case. So the triple test means one thing is have a data, look at how much people are present in this, how many reservoir people are present in these domains, whether it is going to uh, create uh, complacency with the so-called merit system. So these are the three things that M Nagarajan has said in his triple uh, test formula. So Allahabad court reiterated that Uttar Pradesh government before announcing this uh, reservations for other backward classes in the panchayats and municipalities elections, it has to go with triple test formula. So this is why it is in news and this article speaks about what exactly is this, uh, uh, whether we should have this cash based reservation consensus or not. Now, they have spoken some importance of this cash based data in India. First thing is, yes, we should have, so the authors are clearly saying that we should have cash based census. The reason is, in India, cash elites generally believe that this is not necessary because today in the 21st century caste is playing a very minimal role in shaping the opportunities and outcomes but that is not exactly the true thing that is what the author is saying so many people believe that in the 21st century there is no nothing or there is no relevance of caste in creating opportunities and outcomes but this might not be the correct thing because this is what is proposed by some class elites to ensure that class based census are not done. So if it is not done, what is going to be the disadvantage? The disadvantage is you cannot have the data about how many people are located or how many uh, lower caste people or uh, other backward caste people are present in the top hierarchies of government offices. For example, the data shows bureaucracy, the upper bureaucracy after 70 years in the central government still have very minimum amount of SCs and SCs in this population or in these jobs. That is, only 12% belongs to SCs and OBCs in the top cadres of government. So, in order to understand the contours of inequality, in order to understand how caste intersects with the so-called class, gender and regionality, we should have caste based census. That is what the author is saying. So you have disadvantages. You have to understand how inequalities are present within the caste, how it is going to influence the class, how it is going to influence gender, how it is going to influence regionality that should be there. And caste census is also important to empower the so-called low caste people in the political domain also. But today caste is just limited to politics for political gains. So caste based mobilization by politics, that is what caste is being used. But in essence, if you want to make the people, the lower sections to get advantage, you should have a clear cash basis census. One good article to read in the today's newspaper, please go through this article, putting up cash census will only benefit the privileged people, you will have some knowledge or engage some knowledge about this. Right guys, this is all we have in the today's Hindu newspaper. So I'll give you a quick recap about what are the things that you have to read in today's Hindu. So putting up cash census will benefit the politically, uh, the privileged groups. So go through this article that will help you and these all things are not important just remember what is Jan Vishwas bill apart from that that is not important what are the 13 MTAs for your prelims that is important and then what is the difference between FDA and FPA from which countries you are sourcing largest amount of FDA that is the third thing that you have to remember what is Sharia law just for your understanding not important for prelims or mains as such next one is G20 a group of countries that G20 has, you have to have this. Again, this is about the same caste census. So I have said that in the external context page. And then in the editorials, uh, what is the problem with the Indian population uh, control? I have summarized this already. Just have that summary in your mind. That is going to help you. Next one is, what are the countries with which India, uh, what are the states with which uh, Nepal shapes its borders? That is for your prelims. And then, you have Ramapa temple altogether and this is all about today's Hindu that is 29th December. I hope you are liking this right thanks for joining have a good day we'll meet tomorrow with the same Astra series